Um, we had a few uh, loose ends uh, that I ran out of time for last week. Matthew 10.2 is the verse that I totally had wrong. I said 10.12 and didn't know where I was at. Jesus was, when they were arguing over uh, where who was the uh, greatest disciple, this was one of the verses that Jesus, when he... Uh, was talking about the disciples, talked about Peter being the first, uh, probably gave Peter the idea that uh, he was the greatest, even though he would have probably... Uh, but that's, that's the verse I was looking for, and I totally messed that one up. I think I said Mark 10, 12, so I had a couple letters and a couple numbers, right? Um, the word we've been using uh, for... The poor and poor in spirit is patokoi. And I, I don't know, I must have been thinking about Taco Tuesday because I kept saying patakos, and it's patokoi. And uh, it's uh, uh, there's a, a hard O in there. Patokos is, a, is the group. So that's the word if you want to, I, I totally misspelled it. It's P T O C H O I in the English translation of that Greek word. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll try and pronounce that right as we go. The third thing, uh, reversals. I've put the, the reversals that we had last uh, written on the board last week. I wrote them back up there. And like I said, this is your board. This is your place to find, as you read and find things and think of things that are reversal themes in the Bible. Did, did anybody, did you come up with any that you thought of during the week to write up there? Any of them pop into your mind? I'll leave that up every week. And if something pops up, uh, which I think they certainly will when we get done with this lesson, hopefully we get done, um, that, that those will come up. Uh, and then I'd left, a, I'd ask you a question in, in, uh, from Luke 1 in Mary's Magnificat. Uh, she says uh, she was glad that God had raised the humble and scattered the proud. And I asked you who you thought the proud were, and, and then I just left it at that. We didn't have an answer. I didn't give you time to answer. Um, the, sc the scattering that she's talking about, the scattering of the proud or the rulers, which is in Luke 1, was talking about, uh, from her perspective, was talking about all of the um, group or countries that had come in, had overtaken them, either conquered them there or taken them back most often to their country as slaves and, and as servants. And they certainly had to be proud that they had conquered God's people after their history of Israel moving into and, and moving the people of Canaan out and claiming this as a country that God had given to Abraham. And so the, the proud in those days, in, in her mind, had been scattered. They were no longer there. They were no longer ruling over Israel. God had given her the duty of, or privilege of carrying the Savior. All of the uh, schemes to stop what God had planned were not, were scattered were put to the wind and it'll also uh, looking forward which she, she didn't know yet but the scattering of the rulers the, the Pharisees Sadducees it was going to upset that whole apple cart the people that were ruling over them then would no longer be ruling over them the way they had uh, especially in a spiritual sense in a religious sense so that that's the things that I didn't get finished last week in our, we have a great reversal, Matthew 5 to 7, the, the Beatitudes. This week, we're going to talk about the necessity of neediness. Last week, we talked about the power of neediness, and we're going to shift a little bit to the necessity of neediness. So that's where we're going. Okay, let's bow for a word of prayer as we start. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We just ask and call on your Holy Spirit to give 
guidance to the things that are said and the things we hear open our hearts and minds to a new way of thinking about you, to, to your way of thinking about you, and that it will give a new direction and a new uh, fervor for life in your kingdom. We ask you for that. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay. We were, when we left off last week, we were in Matthew 18. So if you want to turn to Matthew 18. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. We were starting at verse 1, and we were kind of in the middle of this whole uh, disciples started arguing among themselves who was the greatest, who was who was going to be the top dog in this group as they thought Jesus was going to set up his kingdom right there in Israel. And so they, their minds were going about who was going to be. Uh, so they were arguing among themselves, and we talked about who might be the first four or the top four. Uh, Peter, John, James, and Andrew uh, were probably the top candidates to choose from. And so uh, th that's where they were. Um, and we, we talked about them not really wanting uh, to know what greatness was. They were arguing over who was going to be great. And Jesus was going to take this in a whole different direction. So as, as we went last week, and the young man that I picked on last week, I must have embarrassed because he's not back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, he didn't want to sit. I had the chair already for him. Uh, God set before him a child somewhere between the ages of four to six. A pideum, they called him then, a four to six year old child, a boy or a girl, it doesn't say. And he said, okay, here you are. This is what greatness looks like. And so uh, there, uh, you can, if you kind of imagine the setting, uh, the disciples had just been arguing about who they thought was the most eloquent, who had done the most work for Jesus, who was the most bold, you know, all of the things that were going through their mind. And here Jesus sets before them a child and uh, um, you kind of think Peter maybe said, Jesus, come here a second. I, I know uh, we, we were asking about greatness. We didn't ask about who was the cutest. We, we want to know who is the greatest. This kid was certainly cute, but that's not what we're asking. We want to know who of us will be the greatest. And uh, so if, you, if you're in uh, Matthew 18, um, Let's, just, let's start with verse 1 so we get it in context here. So I'm going to want to read, start and read verse 1 and 2. At the time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called the little child and had him stand among them. Okay, so that sets up where we are. Um, verse 3, someone want to read verse 3? Okay, a real interesting verse here in verse 3. So Jesus says to them after they've been arguing about this, unless you do what? He has, he has two things, unless you do what? Change. Okay. And become like little children. So what, what was he... What was he trying to get across in that? And the word that we put in there was... Uh, that will probably help us is the word transformed. The word transformed. So what was, he, what was he telling the disciples? Unless you change... Where was he going? The first thing we know is... Jesus didn't think they were like little children, did he? They were, they were like little children because they were arguing over who was the greatest. That sounds like a playground type thing to do. But they weren't humble. It, they humble. humble. Exactly. They need to be humble. Uh, they need to be needy. You need to change from be, thinking you are all it, thinking you are the greatest. You need to change to, some, to someone like this child who is needy of everything, who can do nothing for themselves. 
And, uh, and then he, the second thing he, thought, he says in there is what? Change and then what? Okay. Become. Become like children or become like a child. Uh, again, where was he, Jesus going with this? When you, you need to change, you need to, and in our theme of great reversal, you, uh, to use Kale as deal, they had to change and change the direction they were going and become what? Like little children, which meant what? Dependent on God. Dependent on God, exactly. Which they... To be dependent on God. So this whole uh, the Tokoi thing that we talk that we've been talking about of every one of those seven groups had to become. Jesus said, "Become blessed are the poor, blessed are the Tokoi uh, uh, in spirit." Let down kind of the first thing we think of when Jesus says, Become patokoi, become poor in spirit, is that we have to become like those people financially. We have to uh, uh, just become needy in every area of our life. But He is talking, we're going to funnel it down to you have to be poor in spirit, you have to be spiritually poor, spiritually dependent, spiritually needy. So how do we get to be spiritually needy? And he's going to give us some examples of that. Um, turn to, there's, there's really some interesting, uh, Matthew 19, starting at verse 16. I think... These will help us understand where Jesus is going. Matthew 19, verses 16, starting at verse 16. Someone want to read uh, 16 to 20? Now a man came up to Jesus and asked the teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? What do you ask about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said, what do I still lack? Oh, this, this young man came up and said what? I want... Eternal life. I want to. I want to know what I have to do to be saved, and uh, and then he he lists all of the things which are the Ten Commandments. I've, and he says, I have kept all these things. What else must I do? So he had kept all the rules, and uh, but he he knew that he wasn't following what Jesus had said. So now we did uh, sixteen through twenty. Let's do twenty one through twenty four. Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man had heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Then Jesus said to his disciples, I tell you the truth, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Can I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Okay. So what did Jesus tell him? It's, it's cool that you've done all these things, that you've kept all these rules. That, that's a good thing. What else must you do? Give it all up. Okay. Give it all up. Become needy. He didn't want to become needy. I don't want to become needy. I, I've worked my whole life trying to have enough things to take care of myself and my family. I don't want to become needy. He was a young guy who had all kinds of stuff, a rich young ruler, probably uh, one of the very first ones in our list of uh, people in that group. And uh, what did and Jesus asked him to give up all of his stuff, become needy. And what was his response? He didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. It's a sad deal, isn't it? What, 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 what did he do? 
He walked away, didn't he? Yeah. He walked away from him because he didn't want to give up his stuff. He didn't want to become needy. And so he turned down living a kingdom life with Jesus because he didn't want to become needy. And I think that is a, that becomes, we kind of pick on this young guy, but I think that is a normal human response in, in our worldview. We don't want to give up the stuff we have. We don't want to become needy. We don't want to become dependent on God for material things. And then especially we don't want, we find it hard to become needy spiritually to be dependent on God spiritually. And so that, that's where we're, that's where we're going to head. But th this, I thought, was a great example of, uh, with this rich young ruler. <clears throat> Turn to Matthew 20. We're going to, uh, excuse me, Matthew, we're still in Matthew 18. I'm sorry. I was going one step ahead. <laughs> Down at, uh, I forgot to write the verse down. Oh, the, um, okay, I start at, uh, somebody want to read 13 to 16 of Matthew 20, 13 to 16. But he answered them again, I am not doing a gift to you from them. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be so the last will be first and the first will be last. When we're talking about a reversal theme or God changing things, this is the first one that comes to our mind always, I, I think, or it does for me. When Jesus said, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And we kind of, okay, I kind of understand that, you know, the first uh, that came up there to get paid, the first that started working kind of ended up last and the last ones came in uh, getting paid first, getting just as much as the other guys. And so we can understand that, that Jesus was turning things around, the first shall be last, the last first. So that is kind of where most of us start with this reversal theme is that idea. And, and so then we can, we can kind of build on that. Um, Jesus starts to tell the disciples, uh, that he talks about a shepherd. I, th I, th I thought it was chapter 20, 18 and 20 in there. And, uh, and he tells him that, that, that uh, sheep will be scattered talking to them and was focused kind of as they were taken, uh, as he was going to be taken into Jerusalem. And, uh, and he says to the disciples, uh, you will be like the sheep, you will be scattered uh, when the time comes. And Peter defiantly says, I will not be scattered. I will, I will stay with you the whole way. I will not leave you. I will, I will defend you till the end. Uh, and and uh, Jesus says, you're right, Peter, you will not be scattered. Instead, you will be shattered, which he doesn't say that, but that's the where he was going. You will be shattered because before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter says, I will never do that. I will never do that. And, and where we're going with these is sometimes to get to neediness, to get to neediness in our lives. And, and it's really shown in Peter's life here. And it's a great story of it, or account of it, not a story, uh, a great account of Peter. Peter. And so Peter defiantly says, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will follow you to the end. I know these other guys are going to leave, but I will not. So now, now go to, if you're still at Matthew 26, sorry, I messed that up there. Oh, no, I was right. What am I looking at? Let's, do, let's, do a, let's finish that off. Matthew 26, 26. Let's start there. Someone want to read 26 to 29. How could I miss that? Hmm. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And they took the cup when he had given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood. 
um, of the covenant. Um, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I tell you that I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Okay, so they're they're at the um, Last Supper, and that's it, self-explanatory. Let's go uh, 30 through uh, 35, 30 through 35. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus told them, This very night you will fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go to Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Now let's go to uh, uh, verse 69 in, in the same chapter, Matthew 26, 69. It reads like this, and it says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. And so uh, we get the first part completed because it doesn't talk anything about the other disciples. It was only Peter sitting in the courtyard, and he was probably saying it to myself, I told you so. I told you I'd be the one that would hang with you. Where are all the other guys scattered, just exactly like Jesus said. And so, uh, so he's in the courtyard of Caiaphas, the high priest, so he's in a very... Um, in a place he wouldn't, uh, he would ne not necessarily be very often, or it was uh, a place that was going to be kind of dangerous for him. Um, a servant girl came up to him, as in '69, and, and said, "You two were you two were with Jesus the Galilean." Verse 70, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. I do not know what you're talking about. And it didn't click, did it? It didn't click with him, what Jesus had said. Verse 71, when he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl. So you've got these, these young girls coming up to him and asking him, you know, weren't you with Jesus? Uh, so it wasn't a soldier, someone who would strike great fear into you. It was a little servant girl. But he blurts it out, like in the first one, he blurts it out to all who were standing around. Um, uh, it says, when he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him and said to those who were there, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it. And with an oath, so he's making it even stronger. He is swearing an oath. I do not know the man. But a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you too are one of them, for even the way you talk gives you away. But then he began to curse and swear. I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the words that Jesus said, Before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went on and wept bitterly. The necessity of needing this. We, we talked in, in Matthew 18, Jesus was telling him, you need to become needy like a child. Then in, in chapter 20, which was where I was going before, the, the, what Jesus told him in 18 didn't register at all. In verse 20, we already have uh, James and John's mother coming to him and saying, James and John want to know, and I want to know, which one of these will be seated at your right, which one will be seated at your left. In other words, which one of these two is the greatest? Sitting at the right was a higher position than left. I want to know if these two boys are my two boys are going to be great in your kingdom. And so it still hadn't clicked in. It still hadn't registered where, where Jesus was going with this. Then we, so one of the things that will bring us to where God wants us, and, and oftentimes it's what has to happen, is failure. And Peter failed miserably. And Jesus foretold his failure. But I, I think it is maybe true of all of us that there, we have to come to a failure point in our life before we realize the neediness, the necessity of neediness in our life. We have to have a failure. And Peter's was epic, wasn't it? What was Peter's reaction after he realized it? Yeah. 
went out and wept. What was Judas's reaction? He went out and hung himself, didn't he? Went out and killed himself. We have two different reactions to failure, two different reactions to neediness. Judas thought God could never forgive him. Peter, I, we're not sure exactly what he thought, but he didn't go kill himself. He, he went and wept bitterly, it says, uh, for he realized that he was a failure much more than the other disciples were because he was shattered, as Jesus had predicted. He had come to this necessity, to the necessity of neediness. He realized, I think finally he realized that he didn't have it all, and that's where Jesus was trying to lead him, lead him to, and he tries to lead us to, is that we are not spiritually strong enough to live the way God wants us to do unless we become totally empty. Um, inside... Um, there's a principle inside this uh, inside this uh, reversal theme, and it's a principle of ascending, descending. We are. This is uh, ascending. Obviously, we all we all think our live in a world where we start as a child and and uh, so we, we've got a we start in, in here we're a little child and we keep getting better and better and stronger and stronger we get a, a job we become independent we do all the things that are ascending uh, and that's the way we, we live God says there needs to be a different way to live in the kingdom of God. If you are going to step in and enjoy and benefit from the kingdom of God, there has to be a descending first. So instead, there has to be, and, and this is where Peter was, was failure. He was thinking about greatness, about getting bigger, better, faster, stronger in God's world. Uh, and Jesus would kept telling him, you need to become like a child, you need to descend and become needy. And they, that just didn't go with them. They didn't like it. Uh, they wanted to hear about getting better. But Jesus took him to a place of failure. And then when from failure is where you birth uh, greatness in God's kingdom. It's from down here that we birth greatness in God's kingdom. It's from failure. When we come to that point in our lives where um, everything falls apart, like Peter, where we come to that, uh, what we talked like it was last week about a sacred space, a sacred space when you realize you need Jesus as your savior. As Christians, there's a sacred space where we come, where we know we don't have it in us. We, we as evangelicals are mostly doers. We always are trying to do what God wants us to do. We start to think, I believe, start to think that uh, we, are, we are doing it on our own, and until we realize that we need Jesus to start with, we need to start there and, and then work our way up, become totally needy, totally dependent on God, just like that class group of people, total neediness for everything spiritually is where Jesus was going, become poor in spirit. You will find favor with God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Then we can grow and blossom and become what God wants us to be and it will explain all of the Beatitudes. Um, any, any questions about that? Does that make sense to you? The only thing is maybe to get a sense from that failure is that you, you have to continue that humbleness. Yeah. Um, like we started there ascending you to your own self-confidence and, and not necessarily needing, thinking we don't need God. But when we start over, great point. Yeah. yeah. And how do we do that? How do we, uh, maybe as, as older adults, you know, we've 
learned and done? How, how do we keep that humbleness or neediness as we as we ascend? We, we've if we've gone to this failure point in our lives, and we start doing things and and becoming uh, what God wants us to be. How do we keep that in perspective? It's every, for me, for me, it's an almost everyday reset of a respect for who, who God is and what Christ has done for me, and reminding myself there's nothing that I can do to be good. You know, and, and, and still trying to rely on Him instead of myself. But it's, it's constant having to be you know, because my foolish pride wants to always get ahead of me, and then things start going pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Look, what I, look what I did. Look what I've accomplished in a spiritual sense. Um, and and th this, is, this is not a one-time thing. I think we could write in failure all the way up. There are times when God has to whack us on the head. There has to become a failure as we just plain go through life that's going to click us back to the point where we it's not me doing this. It's nothing. I mean, I am the vessel that God is working through, but that's all I am. God is giving everything. It's all because of Him. Um, one of the when I was in, in uh, college, we would go to uh, a mall in Omaha, and uh, we did evangelism in the mall. We'd walk around before they prohibited it, but we'd walk around and see people sitting down. And we had the, the big thing in the in the early 70s was using the four spiritual laws. And so we, we'd sit down with someone, start visiting with them, and ask if I could share the four spiritual laws with them. And uh, well, we had done that for, we'd do it for two, three hours on Sunday afternoons. And uh, this one particular Sunday, nothing was happening. People were either getting up and walking away or saying get lost or something. You know? And so it was toward the end of the time before we were going to head back to the dorm. And uh, there was an older gentleman sitting on a bench. I said, okay, one more. And so I went and sat down beside him. His name was Ben Price. And he was probably, he was an old man, probably 66. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he was just sitting there, and, and I had, I put in the very least effort into this thing. I sat down, would you like to listen to the Four Spiritual Laws, you know, kind of that way. And I said, sure. And so I started reading it to him, and all of a sudden I heard something. I looked over, and the guy was crying. And he said, keep reading, keep reading. And I, I read him the thing, and I said, at the end, it asked you if you want to accept Jesus as your Savior. And he said, absolutely. And it was just a, a turning point in my life on this field your part, thinking that it was not me at all doing this. It had to be God working through me. It was God working, not, not necessarily in this, I mean, I was holding the deal and I was reading, but God took the words that were in the four spiritual laws and touched Ben's heart. He was a dyed-in-the-wool Catholic. He, uh, uh, and he, I, I didn't know where he was going, but I, we exchanged phone numbers and he called me up and he said, come on over to my house. So I went over to his house one Sunday evening. He had a whole house full of his relatives and he said tell them about this and and they were, they started telling me how different Ben was than he was before and I was just flabbergasted I was just stunned I, I stumbled through something but I don't know what I, I really don't know what I said I just didn't expect it and uh, but it's so taught me that it is not me it is God using me and and every so often God reminds me of that it is not you it is me I touch people's hearts not you I reach out to people not you and like you were saying every day it's we need to be reminded that's that's why it's so important that we talk to God every day that we don't dismiss God from during the week and uh, and come back on Sunday and try and think about God it's a every day walk with him uh, so that God just does such cool things um, so th this is the way we're going and with with Peter um, let's let's look ahead um, it's the feed my sheep part anybody have that on the tip of your tongue John, to Peter. 
Yeah. Um, isn't it the end of John? It, yeah, it's, it, it, well, it could, yeah, that could be in John. I mean, I'm looking in there. I was thinking about this in, on the way in, and I didn't get it. I thought I'd remember, but I should have known better. There we go. John 21, 15. Um, so when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, and so the idea of this is that Jesus did not leave Peter at, at the failure point, and he does not leave us at the failure point. And what, what seems so, or just is so cool about this, and, they, and when they had finished breakfast, Son of John, do you love me more than these? And so uh, the question that he asked him was kind of curious. He says, do you love me? Why would John, or why would John, why would Peter think that Jesus didn't love him? Because he had denied him in front of everybody. And so Jesus came in and was reassuring him, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, I love you. And so then Jesus said what? Amen. Which, which was, why, why would that be encouraging to Peter? Yeah, I want to use you, in which Peter probably thought, after denying him three times in the court of Caiaphas, I am done. My career as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus is totally done. And Jesus said, do you love me? And, and he said, yes, I do. I still love you, even though I didn't act like it. And then Jesus says, go feed my sheep. Go do what we've talked about for three years. And how many times does he do this? What, what's so significant about three? For every time he denied him, Jesus said, do you love me? Go to work and feed my sheep. Do you love me? Go to work and feed my sheep. Do you love me? Go to work and feed my sheep. Took care of that. It was like a salve, I think, to Peter's heart to say, I denied him three times. He asked me three times. He told me three times. Go feed my sheep. Go on and do the things that we talked about for three years. And then that's going to lead up to Matthew 20 where he, in the Great Commission, he tells them to do what? Go you into all the world. Yeah, go you into all the world and make disciples. So again, he was encouraging him to go out and make disciples. So how are they going to do it? We've got Peter uh, feeling needy. What was going to give them the power? Again, we connect with another verse. Acts 1 8 says what? what? Holy Spirit. Yeah, I'm going to give you a helper. If you'll stay in your neediness, if you'll stay in this neediness, spiritual neediness, I will give you a helper. But the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes, I will give you power, is what Acts 1 goes to. And so he is saying, it, again, he is saying, it's not your power. It's not the things you're going to do. It's the things that I'm going to do through you, and I'm going to put the Holy Spirit inside of you. I'm going to give you that power to go out and do what they did. And then it just exploded after that. What happened in the first part of Acts? With not only Peter, but the rest of the disciples that showed that power. How many were saved at the first sermon? 3,000. 3, Second sermon? 5,000. So it just exploded, and, and, all of the, and when the Holy Spirit came, they were given the gift of tongues to speak different languages to the people that were gathered in Jerusalem, and the word just spread like fire when they, when they were in a place of neediness and not in a place of thinking they were great, that they were the special ones. When the Holy Spirit took over and God took over, they began to ascend and head upwards in... So how does that fit with you and I? How does that fit Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 2018? We kind of set the basis for neediness so after neediness comes what? 
dependence on, on God, on the Holy Spirit. And then we can expect great things. Then we can expect the Ben Prizes to be changed when we are obedient to what God wants us to do. We can expect our families to, uh, for God to touch their lives through things we do or say or, or whatever God asks us to do. Only if we are needy and dependent, needy and dependent. That's why God, uh, Jesus started this whole beatitude thing was be blessed are the poor in spirit. We have to become poor in spirit before we can do any of the others that we're going to come on to. Make sense? It doesn't, it doesn't, God doesn't leave it there. Um, One other example, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. We'll run into another guy who was a lot like Peter, who thought he had, he thought he knew where he was going and he was doing it on his own power. He thought he had everything going his way, uh, knew what he was doing. It's going to give us a, uh, 2 Corinthians 12.10. Uh, that, that's a, that's a follow-up to what, what happened to Paul as he was to Saul as he was going down the Damascus Road. What was he on a mission to do? Arrest the Christians. Pardon me? Arrest the Christians. Okay, arrest him, put him in prison, kill him, eradicate this because Paul thought he knew exactly what was right and wrong, and he was about to fix this thing. He was about to put down the rebellion of Christians all over the place. Now, 3,000, 5,000, those are accounts of men, so you have many more than that. Uh, and so he was out and about trying to put this down. These uh, Messiah people that had come, would come up every once in a while would often, or most of the time, they would just fizzle. They would be around for a little while, and that was kind of why Pilate was not in a big hurry to do anything, because he had seen these guys come and go. He all of a sudden, we've got, an, we've got the Messiah that's coming. He'd be around for a month, and it'd be gone. But this Jesus, and the movement that Jesus started, was hanging around, was growing and growing, and Paul, a devout Jew, an Israelite was not going to let this happen. He had the power to change it. So he went around all over the country and was, was heading for Damascus to catch all of them up there. He was gathering up, so he had a group. And what happened with him on his way to Damascus? Anybody remember? God struck him. Yeah, God struck him down. He, he became blind, didn't he? A light, a light or a beam of light came down. He became and was, what was his situation after he was blind? Total dependency and neediness. We go right back to that every time. We go back to the neediness of, God, of having, he needed God. And so God directed him to a, a fellow that shared Christ with him. God restored his sight. And then in, uh, so it, it was that, Realizing that he had failed, the failure, being struck down, finding out that he was needy, that was going to end up with Paul being one of the great writers in the Bible, being one of the great leaders in the early church. And then uh, someone we're going to read uh, 1210. And his wife of Christ's sake had to lay in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. So when I am weak, I am strong. Wow. What a testimony from a guy who was so full of himself, who was so, I can do this, I'm going to straighten this world out. And, and he comes and he says, read that again, Myron, please. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. Okay, stop there. I delight in what? Weakness. I delight in weakness. Wow. I delight in being weak. 
That's a strange thing for someone like Paul to say, and it's supposed to be a model for us. I do go on. And insults. Okay. Who would who would have been insulting him? Everyone probably. <laughs> yeah. I mean, both sides, actually. Yeah. The Pharisees that he was part of and the, the Christians who he was persecuted. Yeah. Well, it's easy to understand why the his uh, Pharisees and Sadducee friends would insult him. Why the Christians? What's that? He was a murderer. He got killed him. They yeah. trusted him. They were afraid of him. Exactly. Can we trust this guy farther than we can throw him? You know, he's, he has just killed all kinds of people, imprisoned all kinds of people. Why should we trust him? I think he's a, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing trying to gather us in. Why should we trust him? What's the next one, Mary? Hardships. What was his hardships? What do we know about Paul's hardships? Well, he had thorn something in his side that was a constant reminder of constant pain, but then also his shipwrecks and all the Things he'd been through while traveling. Yeah. Uh, and, and so those are, the thorn in his side was uh, some sort of something wrong. But then, like you say, all of the circumstances he was in, shipwrecks, which are all physical, what about the spiritual side? What hardships would he have gone through? Because on on, we're talking about being spiritually needy. What hardships would he have gone through? So he constantly was studying all false teachers who were coming in behind him oh, yeah. and, and kind of describing him or giving a different message than what he gave to the churches as after he would either send some send you know, a letter to him or visit them or whatever. And so he was being made out to look as a fool to them. Yeah. Exactly, and he, and he was going on his missionary journeys. Journeys. He was going from town to town, introducing this new thing, and so it was a struggle every time he walked into a new town. And you can imagine the hardships that he ran into every time he moved to a new town. Till he, uh, he wasn't insulted and ridiculed anymore, saying you're an idiot, and they really realized that what he was preaching was true. What, what's next? Uh, persecutions. Okay. Persecutions we know about. What else? Yeah, and difficulties. So life became hard, very hard for Paul. We can probably we can expect the same thing. It is we are gonna ex we are going to ascend in the kingdom of God in doing and being in his kingdom, but it's not necessarily going to be easy. We may encounter the same things as Paul encountered and the rest of the disciples and people throughout the centuries. Living in God's kingdom, following what God wants us to do, is not going to be a bed of roses. It's not going to be all great and wonderful. It's going to have all of these things included into it. And then let's go, uh, God does, does not leave us without a pattern, which is cool of him. Let's turn to Philippians 2, 5 through 11 as we race to the end. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And this one really, when you understand the neediness, you know, I can understand the neediness uh, coming to all of us and coming to the people, uh, all those of us humans. Uh, but God asked his own son to get to this neediness point. So we'll start with uh, Philippians 2. Someone want to read, read verse 5? that again, please. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay. So he is, he is exhorting him to do what? Have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So he's setting up an example. Jesus is going to be your example of getting to neediness. Okay, verse 6. So being in very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Okay, so on an ascending, descending scale, where was Jesus before he came down to earth? He was up here, wasn't he? He was at the very top. And it says, what does it say about Jesus? He did not. 
consider? He was an equal. He still is. He didn't consider it. Oh, but he, yeah, he didn't. He didn't desire or think that equality with God needed, was a thing to be grasped. So, what, what is that? He, he put it in human terms. So, what does that tell us? Jesus didn't what? He didn't think he had to hold on to being God. It was not something to be grasped, to be, I'll never let go of being God. So he was willing to do what was going to be very humbling. So Jesus was willing. That's the first step. Verse uh, 7. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Okay, so what did Jesus do? Descended to the point of descended to a point of a servant. Descended to a point of a servant. God, who Jesus in the Trinity was part of creating the world, of creating everything, of creating man who had now fallen away and needed rescue, he didn't he didn't think that he that being God was something he had to grasp on. He was willing to come down and become as a servant. Uh, verse uh, we did five, six. What was the servant going to do? Let's read verse 8. And being found in the presence of this man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Okay. Why is death on a cross significant? Pardon me? Yeah, who is hung on crosses? Criminals, Criminals and thieves and, and uh, the uh, people that were the most despicable, disgusting people were hung on crosses and the Romans would line their roads with people who were rebelling against them or who were criminals and done things that they called criminal. They lined their roads and he did not, he humbled himself to the point of dying on a cross, not just being embarrassed in Caiaphas's courtyard, not just weeping over that, he wept over Jerusalem, he wept for them, he didn't weep for himself, he wept in the Garden of Eden because he knew it was coming in the Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> going back a little too far, uh, wept in the Garden of Gethsemane and he went to the point of dying a death on a cross as a common criminal taking the place of of who? Us. Us. Put it put back in that day. Barabbas. Barabbas. Yeah, he took the place of Barabbas, who was what? He was a scoundrel, a murderer, a, a thief. Uh, he, he certainly should have been on a cross. Okay, verse, uh, I lose my place here, 9 or where are we on, 9 or 10? 9. 9? Let's do 9. Whatever God exalted him to the highest place in the name, that is above We start the ascending after we descend, Jesus descended, didn't he? And the word he uses here is, but God what? exalted Jesus from that point of dying on the cross, of being beaten and whipped and a crown of thorns on his head, humiliated in front of, every, in front of everyone for no reason, for no good reason. Other, he did that and Jesus and God turned around and exalted him so that what was the last part of that verse? Give him the name that is above every name. Okay. So the name of Jesus had gone from up there to down here, and we're heading back up. Let's read 10 and 11. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. 
Okay. So what happened to, what we went, we're doing this, aren't we? That great ascending, descending theme. Jesus' name was going to be what? Does it say there in the last two verses? That at the name of Jesus... Every knee should go, and every tongue acknowledge. Okay. So what's, what's key in there is, is a word... Jesus' name is going to be, or is above all names. But what is going to happen? Every knee will bow. Is that just of Christians? Everybody. No, it's everybody. Believers, non-believers. At some point, in, we find in Revelation that uh, everyone is going to recognize that Jesus is the way, that Jesus is where eternal life is, and every knee is going to bow, and more than that, every tongue is going to confess, confess what? That Jesus is Lord. Wow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. It's not going to say, okay, I was wrong. They're not going to go just to that point. I'm going to, they're, they're going to confess that, yes, Jesus, you are Lord. You are who God sent. You are God. You are who God sent to save me. And so God gives us this pattern in the life of Jesus of us descending to ultimate neediness in death on a cross, raises him up to the point where every tongue, every knee will bow and proclaim Jesus as Lord. You see that, that place that he set up as a pattern that we need to go? That we need to descend to be needy, to have to, uh, that we have to have him for everyday life. There, <clears throat> I was raised in a little country church where we always sang was out of hymnals, which we don't do very often. And I, I like I like what we're doing. I love it. Um, but there are some hymns that I kind of wish we would know the words to. And, and there's a there was a hymn that I thought of when I was putting this together that we sang quite often. And some of you will remember this: it. It "says I need thee, oh I need thee." What comes after that? Every hour I need thee. And I never thought of it till I caught on to this, is that, I, yeah, I need Jesus, I need God every hour, because I could die at any minute, and I need you to get to heaven. That's why I need you every hour. I never thought about it, is that I need him every hour to live a kingdom life, to live the life that God wants me to live. And I'm going to come across failures time and again, maybe time and again, maybe daily, certainly weekly, that I'm going to, that I'm going to fail and I'm going to need thee every hour. I, I wrote down a few of the things I could remember. It says, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. Uh, I think verse, verse 2 was temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. Verse 3, come quickly and abide. O life is in vain and O for O make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. And I just, I bet I've sang that song 200 times, maybe more, I don't know. We sang it a lot. But it just never dawned on me, I need you every hour. I do, I need, I what? I need you. I need you for everything in life. Every hour of the day, humbleness. So I, I pray that we ask God for humbleness, that we can say, God, I need you every hour. I need you right now every hour. I need you when I walk into the sanctuary. I need you to open my ears to what Pastor Kevin is going to say. When I walk out of here at 1130, I'm going to need you every hour because I'm going to meet people wherever I go for dinner or meet family. Uh, I need you every hour the rest of the day. I need you every hour the rest of my life. I am not independent spiritually, and that's where we're going, is spiritual dependence on God. And then once we reach that, we're going to start next week well, with, I, th that, I think that helps explain the rest of them. Next week we're going to get, blessed are the mourn, you will find favor from God for those who mourn. And that one has been tough. I have struggled with that one a long time, trying to figure out what God means. And we'll get into that next week. But it starts to make sense when, when we keep this in mind, when we start from this point, and then we'll work our way through the rest of them. So, hallelujah, we made it through the introduction. <laughs> it only took three weeks. How about that? Okay, let's pray as we close.
Heavenly Father, thank you for this class. Thank you for the way your Holy Spirit teaches and touches those around us and that you are the one that gives us the power. Help us to recognize our neediness that we cannot, we can do nothing without you, just like Paul said. And uh, help us to keep maybe that tune in our minds. I need you every hour, Lord. I need you to make this thing work because I am, I don't have it. Be with us as we walk and talk through this week with those we meet, that we will be reminding ourselves that maybe they need you as well, and maybe together we can help bring them into the kingdom. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you so much.